Uh, hey, everyone. And uh, I know for some of you that are here with us live uh, and then others watching this recorded, I'm here with Tina Lum from Push Operations, and uh, she's the CEO. And her and her co-founders, uh, Tommy and Danny, have built this awesome company, uh, serving companies across North America to help them with their payroll since 2012. That's a long, that's almost 14 years, Tina. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Start. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Most, most, most companies are, you know, that overnight successes are about 25 years in. So, so at Push, the, the team is really focused on restaurants, on restaurant owners and their time being taken up by things like payroll. And, and if mm -hmm. they are, then they're not doing what they're best at and what they actually want to be doing in their business. And so they have management solutions for restaurants and all in one. Um, help them to automate, scale the restaurants with simplified HR, payroll, workforce management in one spot, and ideally trying to, again, free them up so they can make and have a successful restaurant and not be buried by those other things that make it hard. So Tina, super thrilled that we get to chat today and um, yeah, looking forward to the conversation. Awesome. Thanks for having me on, on the call. Yeah. So please, you know, tell the story, like how did Push come to be? And we we're just talking how yeah, at some point there was, you know, a push accounting and, you know, push payroll and now push operations. How how did it come to be? And I know there's an interesting story, how it came to be in the first place. Yeah. So um, basically what happened was uh, prior to all the tech stuff, like Tommy and I, we actually, our first business, we ran a uh, seafood import exporting business. So we were actually shipping live Dungeness crabs from Prince Rupert all the way to Vancouver, Portland, LA. So that was actually our first venture that wow. <laughs> epically fails, uh, but we learned so much. Uh, part of it was like, hey, you know, Tommy and I, we actually work very well together and we always see um, business partner as equally as important as getting into like a marriage because you spend so much time and yeah. how you guys, how we fight and how we resolve conflicts is really important. So that was the blessing in that business. And then at the time, um, Danny, he's our CTO and my older brother, he's coding, coding. And then he basically was doing some other like coding stuff on the side because crab was seasonal. We basically joined forces and, uh, just, just started like brainstorming ideas. And, um, and then we had probably 25 ideas in between push, uh, that didn't work out. Uh, and then really we landed on push because, uh, Tommy has an accounting background and we got out of the building and we started talking to, we just randomly fell into restaurants cause they were the easiest really? business to door knock in Gastown. So that's all, yeah. So none of us actually have a restaurant background, but it, we, it was only the, they were the business. We knew we wanted to stick in B2B, um, and restaurants were just, you can just solicitate. You can just walk up and ask. It was the open. easiest thing to knock on the door. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. I, I love that. It's just like, you're, you're not overthinking it. You didn't mm -hmm. do 50, 50 years of research. Mm -hmm. Easiest doors to knock, really. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. And, and do you remember who the first uh, restaurant you signed up? Yeah, it's, uh, we actually have a office room named under after them. It's the Fountainhead Pub. Yeah. On Davy yeah. Street. Yeah, yeah. They were the first client that we signed up. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. And how did you figure out that once you started knocking on doors that there was there was an opportunity or a problem there? Well, we did kind of fib a little bit in the beginning. Um, so <laughs> we would just walk up and I'll be like, hey, I'm a UBC graduate student. I'm doing a research paper on restaurant technology. Do you have like five minutes? And then we would have conversations with um, the owners. Word. And then understand like, well, what are some challenges and whatever they told us, we basically went to the other store restaurant and tested it out. It was like, Hey, by the way, it's like statutory holiday hard to calculate. This is what we do. So as we collected more data, we started right. using you it started, as a pitch. You started building your value prop. Exactly. Um, and that's how we got started. It was just that's uh, awesome. restaurant owners feeling bad about talk, like being, being wanting to support students. And that's really how it. Yeah, that's a great in. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I remembered is when I, when I was actually in back in college, I went and did a survey. I actually was a student, okay. but I did a survey on customer service and what people wanted mm -hmm. um, when something mm -hmm. went wrong in a restaurant. Interest. I, I did this. Oh, that was part of my, it was, it was because people always are willing to talk to you, but you know, what's mm -hmm. interesting about that? Like that's the beginner's mind. That's going and asking and being curious and talking direct mm -hmm. to the customer. 
And, you know, for a lot of CEOs, as they scale, they get away from that because mm-hmm. it's, it, and because the answers are there in the market. And mm-hmm. I have this, this, this post-it note here uh, in front of me, don't play office. A lot of CEOs and execs play office and try and look at a report and understand. Yes. Go talk to 10 customers and you'll figure it out almost every time. That is, that is awesome. So you got going. And you started to go down this road. And I'm sure like for all of us, our journeys are bumpy. Um, what were some of the things that that you found were the big obstacles as you started to, you know, once you started to, you know, get more customers, improve your pitch, improve what you're doing? What were the some of the bigger obstacles that you faced along the way? Uh, like in the early days or just throughout yes. the journey? Well, or just throughout the last 12 years, yeah. Yeah, so I think throughout the journey, um, we would, Kevin, we would always get to this point where like we hit a ceiling for mm. our revenue. So we knew we had amazing product because our customers just, first of all, we have the most uh, gracious customers that we're, I always feel so lucky that we have, we're, we work with restaurants because they're the most open and most willing mm. to like connect and share. Um, you want to oh. ask for an hour of the time, they'll give you two hours to kind of share really? about what their challenges. Yeah. So they really help shape our product. So we really um, have, a great product, but I think one of the biggest challenges was trying to like get past the ceiling. We, I remember we were like getting like $10,000 MRR a month, but that it, for like nine months, we just couldn't get oh. 11,000. We couldn't get 12,000. And then certain things happened that we were, okay, we got to like, we were able to break that ceiling. And then again, the next big ceiling was like 50,000. Why can we not get past 50,000? So those are all kind of like the challenges for our revenue engine was like, we, Makes we sense. couldn't get the flywheel going in like a what, predictable what did, way. Got it. And so when you were stuck at 10 or stuck at 50, what were the things that in hindsight, obviously we're all brilliant in hindsight, but in hindsight, what, what were the stuck points or what did you need to free up to get to the next level? We needed to really have a dedicated, like first we needed to like have like dedicated like goals. Like, hey, what do we want to have this week? Not even like, like we had like quarterly goals, but like if we break it down backwards, I think what we were done differently is like, what do we need to do this week? And are we on track, mm. off track the next week? And then like, just see it con- like slowly like progress. Uh, we really just like at the end of the quarter, be like, oh my God, we missed it again. And then we weren't able to like, figure mm. out when did we miss or how much we missed until it was like oh it was over and then we we lost like Got three it. months of time right so you had the macro goal for the quarter but you weren't yes. really grinding on it every week so you didn't have that execution discipline on a weekly basis exactly and i think it's a discipline that we were missing in the beginning days i bet it's hard but wait because you were <laughs> just trying all kinds of stuff yeah it's interesting because for a lot of a lot of a lot of entrepreneurs and you know i was chatting with someone yesterday, the day before about like weekly meetings, for example, and they're, mm-hmm. we're talking they're going, like, what's the purpose of a weekly meeting? I said, well, at the end of the day, it's mm-hmm. to put your goals. First of all, see how you're doing generally quick mm-hmm. overview yeah. of the KPIs, but put your goals on screen and look at the progress you made in the last yes. seven days and make your next commitment. If you did nothing else, it's not supposed to be the update. It's yeah. not corporate show and tell. It's mm-hmm. really to drive execution of the goals because we get distracted and we forget. And yes, bring it back in for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you yes. can relate to that one. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I was reading, and 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 for the we we we, we did, um, did this awesome case study on your your progress. And I was reading how you felt like you were a fox in your early days. Oh, and for, yes. <laughs> oh, say for more sure. about that. Look at the yeah. reactions. Yeah, no, say no, more. we were definitely foxes, and I feel like all. And it's funny because I talk to other entrepreneurs, and they all sort of have the this exciting, shiny things, and I I yes. get romantic by it all the time too. Me too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so for those, the, the, the distinction Jim Collins found in, in his readers, the distinction, distinction between a hedgehog and a fox. A fox mm-hmm. does a lot of things and it's a, it's like the, the jack of all trades, master of yes. none, and it's all yeah. over the place and having a great time. Mm-hmm. A hedgehog is, is a simpleton. It does one thing really well. Hedgehog mm-hmm. has one masterful move. If it mm-hmm. gets attacked, it rolls into a ball and it's protective uh, spine thingies, prickly things, protect it. It just, yep. if anything goes wrong, it rolls in a ball. That's yep. all it does. And, Absolutely. you know, and, and interesting, if you look at most entrepreneurs, uh, the foxes don't scale mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because they get distracted and dilute their energy. But people like us, I'm also, I have a lot of fox like nature, people like us, we're very creative and there's some great things that comes out of that, 
but then yes. you got to go back to the core. That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I, that was a big, uh, big, big ship point for us is just like working on the the habit and the discipline and just knowing that, okay, this is, this is the one thing. Okay. So if you look at those, those plateaus you hit, it was more about discipline. It, it, discipline. Was there anything else that was yeah. part of those, those stuck points? Yeah. Uh, discipline and also I think specialization, like going back to what you mentioned, like the foxes, we were all foxes and we didn't like, like I was halfway onboarding a client in the beginning and then also I'll do like data entry. So like sure. there really wasn't the energy that specialized like, Hey, you're only one thing you're going to work on. It's just ah. getting pipeline or closing deals. So I think things started changing when we had special, we invested in specialized roles of like bringing in an actual like sales development rep that all they do is just generate like um, awareness and pipeline. Got it. Yeah. Right. So that's people wearing every hat to people having like specialized yes. hat that at least was most of their day. Yes, yeah, exactly. That's, that's awesome. So if you just look back before we talk about the four, if you're looking back and you know, what is your biggest learning as an entrepreneur? And obviously it continues, but what are some of the biggest learning or learnings you've had so far? Oh, uh, yeah. So like one of the biggest learning is like, I, I like what you said in the beginning, Kevin, about like that the beginner's mindset. Um, I really think that as entrepreneurs, like I per particularly noticed that our business started leveling up when my entire like mindset and uh, persona like leveled up. So I invest a lot in um, beginning days, especially uh, where I had a lot of like worthiness conversations. Like there's no way I can work with mm -hmm. Earl's like I like who are we to compete against like the ADPs or billion dollar companies and a lot of that conversation internally really capped our business in getting like that inside your own head your own yes. internal conversation yes internal conversation so I had so much fear around like failure and like rejection um so I think for me, like when I meet new entrepreneurs, it's like, yes, you can fine tune your skill set, but the first thing I would recommend to fine tune is that internal sort of self image and conversation, that voice. Yep. Uh, Cause that literally served me um, in the moment I actually felt like, yes, our product can compete against these big companies. And like, who, who why, why can't Earl's be our client? Why can't, why not? Earl's? Why not? Um, so, and I know that the value we bring, so the moment I started believing it, the team believed it, then the customer just like came. And I think that was my number one, um, sort of beginning days of like that shift. And I saw it directly shift and translate into the business. Yeah. Well, it's in, everyone has sort of some sort of degree of imposter syndrome when they're getting started. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? Unless they've already done it, but most entrepreneurs haven't done before what they're doing now. So people mm -hmm. have that. It's a normal part of it. Mm -hmm. So how did you, how did you, how did you, how did you change the voices in your head? I guess <laughs> what, did, oh. what, what helped you? So a lot of like, like a lot of audio, like I like, like I was like fanatic men mentee. Like I listened to like, Tony Robbins, Wayne Dyer, all these different, like, um, sort of like mental, like, mm -hmm. people, like yep. self-development. Uh, so I did that a lot. I actually took some courses that literally allowed me seven days of just being unplugged and going That's to awesome. a arena and just like, just pause. Cause I think one of the big things is like, we spend so much time upgrading like our phone or our MacBooks, but like, how often do we look at Upgrade our ourselves. own internal like software? Like what, it, what am I believing? Why, why is this? So like just having that space to like review and internalize like, okay, Hey, why do I like feel like I'm not deserving or these kind of like programs? Yeah. So uh, really, I really invested a lot in, in that, those, those courses. And just, you know, I always say like inspirations, like every day you need to take a bath. So like I listen to something in the background while I'm getting ready just to like, get me like back into that good mindset for, to start the day. Mm-hmm. Well, I heard um, a very successful CEO uh, say, and he said, you know, at the end of the day, building a better business comes from becoming a better human. Yes, I love that. Yeah. And we think we're building businesses. And, and it's interesting when I worked with hundreds of entrepreneurs, what we watch, the ones who are doing what you're doing, and, and by the way, that is the default, what I hear from a lot of people behind the mm -hmm. scenes, the most successful mm -hmm. CEOs and even the most successful executives. Because otherwise you hit your own glass ceilings, your yes. own, and where you're coming up against your, it's just you, you're coming yes. up against yourself and your stuff. Yes. 
you know, in yes. your oxygen mask first in, in the chapter, which is deal with your emotional junk, which mm -hmm. you're identifying. I think everyone needs 30 to 40 hours of therapy and a whole bunch of uh, personal growth. It's, yes. and by the way, the most successful people I know almost all do it. Mm -hmm. It's not publicized because, because that's how you become a, a better person. Never mind. The fact is it's also how you become happy with what you achieve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't do that, you're going to achieve. And then you're going to be on the achievement addiction trying to do more, which I mean, lots of us still are, but it's, it's finding the happiness within that, that, that journey. It's really interesting, Absolutely. Tina. That's a great, that's a, it's great that you shared that because that is very common. And, mm -hmm. and the leaders, because when you do that, you're radiating a better version of yourself. That's yeah. authentic because you're comfortable yep. with it. And, mm -hmm. and it's also like the growth of the business. There's always another level. Absolutely. For sure. That is, that is awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's funny. And that's why I love talking and sharing, uh, talking with CEOs and sharing this stuff, because it's most people that are very successful do the same things. Like yeah, if you, you know, look at funny. like, you don't hear it. No, because nobody. Because at the end of the day, most CEOs and executives they're out there portraying this personality of success, and they're almost representing their business when they're speaking. And people yeah. don't like to talk about this stuff. But yeah. this is this is what happens in behind the scenes all yeah. the time. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you're not you're going to hit those psychological blocks, mm -hmm. and you need. And by the way, I, I did all those same things. I'm you know, I've been yeah. doing this thirty years, and I, I went through the other day, and I went through and I found a whole bunch of the old um, audio cassettes. Because oh, back when nice. I started yeah. in the nineties, when I started doing all that stuff, it was cassette <laughs> programs. And there was like Anthony Robbins and Brian Tracy mm -hmm. and Wayne Dyer mm -hmm. and all Brian of Tracy. these. Yes. <laughs> yes. All of them. Um, and, and what's interesting is, you know, and, and the most successful leaders are generally, they're studying the business principles and yeah. they're studying the personal. Yes. Yes. Right. Cause the personal helps with the fulfillment and getting out of their mm -hmm. own way. And then the business mm -hmm. for scaling it's both because yeah, you got to scale both. the company. It is both. Otherwise. Yeah. And even. Even in the research, top grading did on on the top ten percent of executives, and they found mm -hmm. that they read about twenty four books a year, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it was twelve business, twelve personal. Yes, and personal can be anything. It could be, yep. you know, biographies or histories. Anyway, that's awesome. That's that's awesome. very cool, Tina. So, uh, along your path, you met this amazing person who I also met on my path, named Dean Ritchie, mm -hmm. one of our advisors on our team. And Dean, um, you know, is is was the first advisor that I started working with. And I used to be very skeptical about other coaches and advisors. And Dean is an absolute master. And I continue to learn from him yes. um, uh, all the time. He is an absolute master advisor and, and just the, you know, just a, the pinnacle of, of what a great advisor should be in my mind. And I know I can see mm -hmm. that. And I know you, you work well together. And so how did you meet him? And, and how did, yeah, how did you end up looking for and or meeting Dean and say, thinking that this would be something that would help you? Yeah, uh, great question. So uh, we actually like started, got to a point where like we were at, I think like 30 something uh, t like team members in our organization. Yep. And we started feeling like, hey, what's going on? Like, why is everyone going in this direction? And we're just not aligned. And people were like working on different things. I'm like, that's not important. Um, and then tr truth be told, our fa the founding team, like the founders, like we were also like, focusing on different things. We all had our own little Fox mentality where, you know, Tommy was working on this thing that he thought was really important. I was working on something that was super important. And, uh, I, I came across like scaling up and we're like, Hey, this is like amazing. Like we should try implementing it. And, uh, the three of us actually did what it suggested to do was like, take a day off, get off site. And like, and we rented her like, like a little like office room outside of her, um, in downtown Good. outside of our yep. office. And then I was facilitating. I was facilitating and trying to like, guys, let's work on this map. And it was hard, Kevin. Um, yes. Like other found, like our, my other two founders are amazing, but they were like checking their phone. They weren't engaged. And, yep. and it, it, there's so much emotion behind like, you know, what are, what do you think the brutal facts are? And then we started getting into like heated discussions about them and just, was just not working. So we decided to be like, okay, well, how do other companies like champion scaling up? Cause obviously it's like a, this, we thought of this as like a map of like yeah. map to your business. Great and, way and to scale. put it. Yeah. Yeah. And then we're like, okay, well, what, what do other companies do? So we actually started looking into like companies or people that actually facilitate. And we never really like thought about like, oh, facilitation is one of those things. Um, 
But then we went to, um, we went to actually this like one day seminar with this other company that was, you know, talking about high level scaling up. But we, we just didn't resonate with that particular coach. Um, and randomly, um, I took like I always do networking, and I I, I took uh, Adam Jones from Thinkific, the VP of uh, Sales, yep. for coffee because we we're like, hey, we're about to like hire our first VP. Like, can you give us some like advice on what this person should look like? He was so generous with his time, and he started talking to us about like like scaling up. I'm like, oh, you do this too. This is great. Uh, but what? How do you guys do it? And I thought it was like an internal, like team member from their company that champions it and then he mentioned uh dean we work with this amazing coach dean and then i remember right after the coffee i like went on the website i emailed dean like info at lawrence and co didn't hear back for a week and i was like okay i really need to get a hold of this person and then i asked uh, adam for introduction um and it's just like, I'm very, like Kristen knows this about me. I'm very spiritual and I'm very like intuitive. So I remember yep. when I first uh, looked at like Dean's profile, I was like, look at this guy. Like he just looks like a really kind, kind coach. I'm like really resonated with me. Um, and then, and then Dean reached out and um, funny fact was like, as much as we were interviewing him, he was like, I want to come, I want to come over to your office. I want to see like how your office looks like. And we were like, and then suddenly I'm like, oh, wow, he's interviewing us. This is like, this is great. It's a good testament that Dean yes. is also equally as selective with his clients. Um, so yeah, we just met and he came to our office. That's awesome. Yeah, we find in this interesting, Tina, that, that they, and Dean and for all of us, we, we want to meet one to make sure that there's a fit. Also mm -hmm. make sure people are ready to do the work. Yes. Like a lot of people just want the newest, latest, latest, shiny thing, and they're yeah. not going to do the work. Then that's mm -hmm. that's that's nobody's going to win. Yeah, awesome. Totally. So tell me, and again, Dean is awesome. And we're, you know, he's and it's you know great the work you've done. What has he? What are some of the greatest contributions he has done for you and your team? Like in terms of, um, yeah, how, how has he helped you the most? I guess I would change say, yeah. Ooh, where do I start, Kevin? It's changed. Like you know, one thing I Dean's going to hate this, by the way. Dean, Dean, <laughs> Dean's, Dean's, I can see he's on the list of people listening. And Dean, we know that you're, you're awesome. And he probably is cringing at the moment, but he is, he is <laughs> masterful. And, and now you have a great relationship with him. So what are the things that really have impacted the most? Yeah. I think one thing is um, really Dean coming into our um, business and setting up the foundation for like, get the methodology of like, Hey, what is scaling it? What are some of the key components? Um, we at the time again we're going back to we were super like fox like looking at what what do we need to achieve today and tomorrow but not looking at the thirty thousand feet mm -hmm. of like hey so one of the biggest thing in the beginning is dean really took us out of our day-to-day -day reactive um behaviors to like hey what is that you guys want to do and go back to the dreaming state so mm -hmm. that was like number one and then number two was like um he really held us accountable to sort of like our commitments with our goals and help this plan. And I think like as our business evolved, uh, you know, we obviously don't, um, we always challenge our team, but True. we're Dean. What I like the most is like, as we grow, he grew with us and he was able to challenge us as executive leaders of like, Hey, what are, what are some things that you need to think about? That's three years from now, not like the one year. Mm. Um, so that was, um, that perspective. Um, and also setting up these like foundational rhythms where I just feel like a lot of our business where it is at now is contributed to the, the work that Dean and Lawrence and co has done for us, because I can tell you that the business literally just like that has a momentum and the flywheel to really do its own thing. I think before uh, we work with you guys, um, a lot of the results were so correlated to like my actions for that quarter. Mm. And I can tell you now that like, I'm sometimes like, Dean doesn't know this, but sometimes like I pinch me moment when I look at the, the survey results from our team. Cause I'm like, Oh my God, I feel like I was like, maybe a little bit less engaged this quarter, or like I was a little burnt out from last quarter. And my direct like feelings of how I assessed a quarter was probably like a four out of 10. 
And then we pull up the T2 survey, which I'm always like, oh, like I need to like be in a good state to review it. Cause yes, I'm always looking yes. to see like- It's a moment of shit. truth. Yes. Yeah. Is it, is it, is it? And then it's just always like, whoa, how are we like at 8.6 this quarter? And it, it, it's just, that got me so like excited because now it's like, the business is in the part where it scales and it's not tied to like my actions, my, how I show up. The, the, the team and the company knows exactly what it needs to do. Mm-hmm. They got their own rhythm, uh, whether I'm there or not, it doesn't matter. And I think that just like that very exciting mm-hmm. freedom that I really got from like working with yeah. you guys and Dean to like really like, I, I can say like our business has scaled. I couldn't yeah, say that. I- like four years ago. Yeah. yeah. Well, that you're you're describing uh, the principle of clock building, not time telling from Jim Collins. Mm-hmm. You've built mm-hmm. a clock that it's, it's and the flywheel together. It's doing its thing. Yes. And it's not completely dependent on you pushing things yes. consistently. It's, it's, a, mm-hmm. it's, it's what every entrepreneur dreams yes. of building a business versus them running on the treadmill themselves. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, on the other side, you know, fun, you know, part of your, your story, you know, fun is really a part of your culture and tell like, and as a lot of businesses scale, they get more serious and then they get mm-hmm. more, you know, boring and less engaging. And how do you bring fun into your culture? And then how do you balance that with people also making sure they get their work done? Yeah, definitely. I think it goes back to like our core values of our, as our core beliefs as founders is that we spend majority of our waking hours with your work community. And it's like your most productive, precious time of the day. And I really find it like as a, almost a curse if you're part of like a community that you don't love the people you're working with. You don't yes. love what you're doing. You don't feel like you're making an impact. So we never take it lightly where a team member, like till this day, like if somebody joins our team, I'm all, I'm still like, it's still super surreal for us to be like, wow, you entrusted us with your career. So I think a really big balance is like, at the end of the day, like people do the best work when they're having fun. They got the play, they got the impact, they got the challenge. So we make it a conscious effort to really make sure that, yes, we run a very serious business. Like we, we process like billions of pay, billions of dollars in payroll and it, it can yeah. get very serious, uh, but really balancing like the, the side of like wins with, with fun. And we sort of trickle it in through uh, different ways. Like, Things that are super like boring, like our town hall, um, it's one that we have a theme and we just do our best to like, okay, everyone's going to expect to be the same boring type of town hall. Like, how do we make it fun? And fun is really uh, things like we would dress up as astronaut as astronaut costumes so for, like <laughs> or like this year it's lighted up. So we got everyone like little Trons, like lighted up suits um, just to make it like more engaging, fun. Personally, as much as it is for the team, I think it's for us too. <laughs> Cause we've like yeah. done so many town halls. We're like, God, this is like, I just, it's just so boring. Um, for all the way you. Through- so boring yeah. for you. For me, for me, yes. exactly. Yes. Super boring for me. So just thinking of ways to like get outside of the box. And mm. um, I love the book that Dean recommended, The Power Moments. How yes. do you break the script? Cause you know, I feel like, as we, as I was doing breaking the script for the team, I realized it was actually breaking the script for me to make it more, um, you know, more exciting. Um, we also consciously have like uh, in part of our OKRs, like team events. How yep. do we make sure we have we don't lose sight of what the things that we, you know, when we were a small company, we used to have always like you know, uh, happy hour Friday. We play games. How do we continue doing the things that made us great? Uh, to as we scale to make sure we're not losing those things that made us like very charming and people reason yep. why people um, wanted to join us. Um, and sometimes it's hard, Kevin, because like we're at like 135 team members now and we, we've we always had a day event where we bring the whole company together. Right. And some years, like especially during COVID, you're like, oh, I just really don't like so easy to say I don't want to do it. It's so easy to not do it. Yes. So easy yeah. not to yeah, to not do it. And there's such a good like 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 reason. But then um it's just one of those things that I always rem- remember um Dean like mentioning and have the voice of like never lose sight of things that made your company great. Yeah. Uh, as you grow. Um to continue doing those things that make, make your relationship. And it's something I bring to my relationship too. with my partner, 
because we yeah. get busy and we always do our like our gratitude list at the end of the night. And then it's like, there's days where like, you know, he's traveling and I wouldn't, I wouldn't like, you know, like, like I can just like go to bed and not do it. But it's those things, those little moments that makes your relationship great or your business great to like, make sure you never like stop doing them. Yes. It's the disciplines. Yes. It's those little disciplines that make all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, it's interesting as we've seen through the years is that it's often like Dean called out to you when you're going and you're scaling, you often drop some disciplines or things yes. that made, and you don't even realize it. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. generally when companies get in a lot of trouble, we just backtrack. It's like getting lost in the woods. Yeah. You just backtrack to where you yes. were and then get regrounded and go again. Yes. Cause it's yes. almost always because we stop stuff, mm -hmm. but we, yes. but you, 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 you forget it. That's good. Yes. So a couple rapid fire questions I want to go through. I'm going to ask you about, um, your favorite tool from all of the tools that you use to run the business. And then I'm going to ask you about book. Uh, and then I'm going to go, so we're going to go through rapid fire here. So a favorite tool that you have incorporated into your business that really helps you to lead your company. Favorite tool. There's so many. Um, I know or you can do for two. Us, <laughs> I think, uh, okay. Uh, the hedgehog concept. Mm. Um, I think at the time we were just not sure about like our, we were constantly got these injections and we're, and, and we're like, a, as entrepreneurs, we're, we, the worst thing we, we know our fault is that we can't say no. We're very, it's yes. hard. We're yes culture. Yes, right. So we started getting like, so making sure we like the hedgehog really like for us to consistently drill it into our, our exec team, our team. Yep. This is what we're going to be great at. This is what we're passionate about. Uh, we like, how can we be the best in the world? That really for like about maybe a whole year, every town hall, every all hands, we just had the hedgehog concept to make right. sure that if sales brings in a non uh, ideal customer profile, like yeah. we need to see how it fits and consciously either decide we're going to take it in and we know, or we're going to reject. So it's just a good framework to really build yep. that discipline and focus. And the second tool is uh, key seats. Uh, going back to like first who, then what, uh, it's, it's the number one thing where anytime <laughs> we have challenges in the business, we can go back to the roots is that we don't have the right who. So making sure that we're always like quarterly reviewing, um, the key seats, getting our, um, like empowering our like people leaders to review their key seats and then challenging them on like, Hey, why do you put this person as like a potential a, and like seeing how their thinking process is with their team uh, is really a big piece for helping us scale and making sure uh, yeah. we can continue having the right, right people in our business. Yep. And as you scale, those, those things are critical. So those are two tools that both help you to stay disciplined. One on the strategy and saying no, yes. and the second on managing your key people in their role. Yes, awesome. exactly. Um, outside of scaling up, which is, you know, full set of tools and everything else, what would you say on the personally and then business books that have impacted you the most one for each yeah so the one i oh for personal the one that i always go back to is uh thinking grow rich uh it's just like i just this... recommended it to someone again yesterday it is okay so, um, it's so amazing it's the best like 11 I have an original books. 1930s oh I have an original 1930s i think this is one of the first first couple editions i have a what? copy sitting right there yep that does wow that's a that's a vintage cover you got uh, there it is but it's it's a spectacular it it's is. it's sorry go ahead i got excited there go ahead Tina. <laughs> yeah no so thinking you're rich is one that i every yeah. time i need a little bit of like a mental boost i listen to yeah. that any chapter like faith yep. is one that i love yep. so much um and then uh so that one is a really good one right now i'm uh really last last year i just took a joe dispenza seven day retreat course oh, okay so right. I've been into just listening to a lot of Joe, reading a lot of his material uh, on on just the metaphysics side. Yep. And then business books. Uh, honestly, I I just did like a manager leadership. I go back to Jim Collins. That's one thing that I'm obsessed with. Is just if I I told myself if there's one book I really want to master and study and like a principle is Jim Collins book. And it kind of rotates from like referring back to good to great to be like, oh, right. The people strategy side. Uh, last week I was just re revisiting uh, B2.0. Yep. 
Uh, so that was like one that I just opened up. So again, a lot of the Jim Collins uh, principles is what for business that we always yep. go back to foundation. We have in our core, you know, for, and for many of our clients, we continue to cycle and recycle through the Collins books and principles because yes. that's really almost everything that you need to scale. Exactly. And then scaling up is the framework or tools to implement it. But Jim Collins principles of the core, scaling up to implement it, and then other ones uh, kind of as needed. There's other lots of other ones that bring great mm -hmm. ideas. Mm -hmm. But that's like the core, core, core strategic content for a CEO anyways. Awesome. Exactly. Um, your growth has been spectacular. You know, it's been like, you know, from the time that you're working with Dean, like five times your MRR. Mm -hmm. um, what, do, what do you see coming in the next, in the next 12 years? You've been 12, in, you're in 12. What do you see in the next 12? The next 12, yeah, we, we see continuously like growing and scaling and really looking at, um, Looking at growing geographically, uh, I think there's a lot of uh, one of the you know many ideas that people came through is like, hey, we got like UK, UK business, and I honestly one of our purpose is to help people do what they love, and restaurant tours. They obviously you mentioned that they they didn't they're chefs and they didn't yeah. drum up a restaurant because they wanted to like do the back end paperwork. It's a necessary evil, and one thing that we consistently uh, ask ourselves is like. Hey, if push disappear tomorrow, will our customers mm -hmm. miss us? Mm -hmm. And will our team miss us? And I think those questions really keep us so humble. And in a state where like we consistently look at like, wow, the we're, we just feel like we're scratching the surface in terms of like the ecosystem that we're able to like build to support uh, business owners and also create like a platform to have to have like a culture where amazing team members can really come and make an impact and grow themselves. Um, so in the next 12 years, we're really looking to see like, how do we take what we've done and really like amplify it to like other regions, other areas. Uh, we're going to stay in the lane of like restaurants because there's just so many. And again, my passion for like, like the, their cust as customers, they're just so yep. gracious and got similar alignments and values as us. So we definitely want to look and see how we can serve more businesses, um, you know, not just uh, outside of North America, just other places as well. That's awesome. That's fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As you say all that, I mean, I come from a restaurant family, like my grandparents owned lots um, of restaurants and yeah. I worked in them as kids. They have such a high failure rate because chefs yeah. and restaurateurs have the passion but the operational part and particularly managing payroll, managing yes. payroll costs and the people piece is so hard. Mm -hmm. uh, that's awesome. Um, two more questions and we'll, we'll, we'll um, wrap up. So if you were to go back and start again, what would your first hire be? You know, outside of having your, your partners, but what would your first hire be if you were to start from scratch from zero today? It would be a VV, VP of revenue. Yeah. Yeah, we would like talk about like, okay, I would say VP revenue if it was the same person we have today in the seat. Uh, <laughs> talk about like an example of getting the right who, like, holy cow, Kevin, we got the right who. It took forever and like to find, but like maybe- As like, it does to find great talent. It doesn't just absolutely. show up at your door normally. Yes. Absolutely. Which is another reminder that I always got to be, oh, I got a virtual bench. Uh, just make sure we have people available and have that network. Um, but yeah, definitely uh, when we, that was such, we I consistently tell the story of like, man, the moment we found the right who, that literally scaled our business to a different level. Um, so that would be like our first, first focus. Awesome. And if you were to give advice to, you know, the Tina 12 years ago or somebody new starting, let's just take it, somebody new starting and early in their business, what advice would you give them now? The advice I would give them, uh, like either to myself or somebody starting is like, hey, love that you are so excited about your business, but like, what are you doing to work on your mindset? What are you doing to like make sure that you are leveling yourself up and making sure that you're kind of you're not blocking your own ceiling? And the second piece is like it's it's one that I would tell my younger self to. And I I realized through personal development that I had a bit of a commitment challenge where like I would just do something half ass, drop it, but never oh. fall through. So the discipline is one that I would recommend. Like it's almost counterintuitive because you want to be like a creative and beginning as an entrepreneur, yes, of course. but really the discipline was what made such a 
big difference to see that creativity come into life. And at the end to see the results, because I had, I had so many like ideas, but zero results, Kevin. And I think that discipline would be one that I would uh, advise entrepreneurs to like focus as much as they can. Awesome. So last thing, just on you and, and what, you know, two things I want to dig into is just uh, quickly is what is it that you're enjoying most about your role today and what you're doing? And then secondly, we'll talk about your resilience and how you take care of your, your own resilience, which you've hinted at a bit. But the first question is, so what What about, what, what part of what you're doing today do you get most excited about or most energized by? I get most energized uh, right now is actually through uh, coaching our people leaders. Mm. We have so many um, new um, like people leaders that have really grown within the organization. There were individual contributors, and then now they're literally like becoming like first time managers. Mm. So that 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 very curious and young and excite, excitable energy that's what I really love, and really making sure that they're equipped. Uh, to make sure that they, we're empowering them to do their role. And and, um, and a lot of the key pieces that I think the inspiration comes from actually working a lot with Dean. I, bet. I love the way he fit, like he structures questions and it's just drawing it out of the person versus giving them the answer. I can tell you that every time I send an email and Dean's like, and I, and I, I go straight to like asking for his perspective he would come back to tell me like, well, what, what would you, what would be your first stab? Um, yep. Like a so great coach would and a great <laughs> leader would. Yes. So I think like working with Dean, I, I just saw so how the impact he had on me as a leader. So I really like wanted to transpire that to like our, our team and working with our people leaders a lot more and just like having that kind of facilitation, um, perspective with them. So I'm really enjoying that. So like, again, like going back to like learning about these principles and how I can cascade yep. that down to our team. And then, so that's what I'm enjoying the most. Um, and also like building like a great culture. Like I, I mm. want to make sure that like a 30,000 feet that we have the pieces in place that we're consistently attracting the right a players, the right team members. And then also uh, making sure that we have a system in place to, to, to make sure that they're growing within the organization. Mm. So those are kind of like the stuff that I really enjoy right now. That's awesome. It's all, it's very rewarding. I bet. Mm -hmm. And and so funny for you for resilience, like you've talked, I've heard you talk about, you know, like reading and, 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 you know, stuff that inspires you. What, what are the, what are the two or three things that you think they'll have the biggest impact on your resilience? Cause there's tough times and, yeah. and we need, we need those things that can kind of keep us charged and having faith and belief to that, that we'll get through it all and, and, and thrive in the end. So is there any, what else really impacts or do you do for your own, for yourself? Yeah. So a couple things I've been doing, um, in terms of our regular rhythm is I do meditation. Mm. So I meditate, um, every morning and every night. Um, and it, it doesn't have to be long. It could, if I don't, if I'm struck in time, like I give myself like even like a eight minute meditation. Yeah. And I, I notice that when I don't do those meditation, there's just, my day doesn't feel the same. Like little yeah. things that doesn't irk me tends to irk me. So it's almost one that I'm just, I'm committed no matter if I'm traveling, it's, I got to do that, that rigor of like morning, evening meditation. And then on the weekends, if I had like a really big, crazy, hectic week, I go into like an hour meditation. I find that that just wow. puts things into perspective for me to be like, okay. Cause a lot of times like we don't, I like, at least I get so busy that I don't, I get so reactive and I don't take a step sure. back to be like, Hey, yep. what, wh why did, why did I feel this way? So I think that broadens my awareness a lot. Yeah. So I do that as building my resiliency. And the second piece is that uh, I always do a uh, gratitude uh, journal. Yeah. So in the morning, uh, right after meditation in the evening, I do like three things I'm grateful for one thing I'm proud of myself. And I think the proud mm. is one that it's builds my own personal internal resiliency where I don't need, I used to, I used, to, I used to see that I seek external compliments or like, sure. you know, people tell me that I'm doing a good job and that like literally get, like made my day. And that obviously it, it just, it, it, it's not sustainable because if you don't receive that, then you have like a crappy day or like I used to tie my yeah. like 
you know, my happiness based on if we hit our like sales target today, I'll be so happy. If I did it, my day would be, um, you know, right. in a different. You're anchored. You're anchored externally. Your your how you felt exactly. was anchored externally versus internally. Yes, exactly. So then I think when I started actually being my own cheerleader and recognizing, hey, Tina, by the way, like, I know that was really tough, but you did a really good job. And I'm very proud of you. It's almost like talking to my inner child and building that resiliency sure. where now I can weather the storm and I can just, I don't need the external factors to drive my state. Um, I think that allows me to be more centered and more calm. So I would say uh, those two things are like my go-tos. Mm -hmm. You know, interesting, Tina. So, and I, I have similar, for instead of meditating, I tried that doesn't work for me, uh, although I tried hard, but I do journaling and it gets mm -hmm. me to the same place. It's it's yep. calming my mind, getting yep. regrounded and reflecting. And mm -hmm. I get epiphanies like crazy and everything gets simpler and, and, and clear. And same with gratitude, often gratitude in the morning, gratitude in the night. Interestingly, um, it was a, another interview I did with a, a CEO, Mike Welland, who, um, meant his mental health went all the way to the extreme of red plus and his life was on the line. Mm -hmm. And uh, I connected him with another CEO who had been there and been through that journey, which was brutal. But when they talked, they said the, the number one thing, uh, and that's in the interview with Michael, um, he said is that the daily gratitude yeah. and appreciation first thing in the morning, because they would normally wake up in, in terror because they were, yes. so, they were so stressed. Uh, was the number one thing yeah. that made the, one of the biggest differences for him. So that's when you're in an extremely bad place, but even just to yeah. sustain a positive mm -hmm. place. And I hear these things all the time from, yeah. from CEOs and leaders, meditation, writing, um, questions like that, or yeah. reflection is those are the disciplines that high performers mm -hmm. need mm -hmm. in order to sustain it. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Tina, this has been great. I always love chatting with you and, and, and your story and your, your experiences are awesome. And I love how open you are and just, you know, sharing your, your journey. Any, any final things that you would share that you'd like to share before we wrap up? No, I think like, I, I, I encourage all like entrepreneur and CEO, uh, whenever they can just go back to play. I think one thing that I, um, I always go back, like, I love being around children, um, mm -hmm. just because you see those qualities of, uh, what a child actually embodies like forgiveness, resiliency, tenacity, playfulness. Um, and that's, that's, I always get so inspired and making sure that I'm consistently like, remember to do those things. Like I, I think yeah. of like my, when I had a big week, like going out to the forest and just playing no expectation. I don't need to like have any goals of like, this is what I'm going to do in the forest. It's just like letting my mind be free. And I think that is like another balance of like incorporating fun and just making sure you're you're having fun because I think a lot of times entrepreneurs, you're right. You wake up like in terror, but just yeah. the balance of that, uh, they would be like my, my last like suggestion on yep. making sure you're taking care of your own play playfulness. I like that, Tina. And when, when people are doing that, you can feel it because then that radiates yeah. out of them. Mm -hmm. And when we're tight and serious, that also radiates. So not only are you better, but you're going to have a better radiation or radiate better things on people. That's Absolutely. Awesome. Absolutely. Tina, thank you so much. Appreciate you making the time to share your story. Uh, shout out to Dean for the great work that he continues to do with Tina and the team. And uh, everyone that's that's watching this, uh, if there's something we can assist you with, let us know. And there's great people like Tina. Like Tina has called and knocks on doors and talks to the restaurateurs and reaches out to people. You know, reach out to Tina if you want to learn about her and what they're doing. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks Have a wonderful me. day. Thank you. See you soon. Bye. Bye.